So thank you for joining us today. We're excited to host our second conversation in partnership with the NSPCC as part of our Year of Childhood hosted by the Children's Parliament. Today, we will be continuing our focus on early childhood and the discussion around what kind of changes, tools and practices are needed to allow infants' voices to be meaningfully heard and understood in decision making, given the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scottsdale. We are delighted to be joined by Professor Kay Tisdell, who is here to share her, her thoughts with us. Kay is a Professor of, uh, of Childhood Policy at the University of Edinburgh. She is part of the Childhood and Youth Studies Research Group, and her own policy and interests are in human rights, children's human rights. She works collaboratively with children, young people, and others on research projects addressing participation in fields such as early childhood learning, domestic abuse, and family law. I'm Carmel, I work with the Children's Parliament, and my background is in education, but specifically in the early years. So we know this is a huge question to cover in just 20 minutes, so we will be continuing this conversation with one of our sector webinars later on in the year. So now it's time to welcome our guest speaker, Kay, Kay, please could you share your interest or your inspiration for participating in this conversation? Well, thank you for the invitation. Indeed, it's such an important and interesting topic, clearly looking ahead with the UNCRC um, and incorporation, it sort of raises the level. Um, but it's been an ongoing issue about um, making sure that we really are inclusive of younger children. It's about, we could sort of quite easily say, oh, well, we didn't include them because, and I think with this inspiration, um, maybe we can really have really good conversations about it and move it forward because it's every child's right to have their views considered. That's great. Thanks, Kay. So today our conversation focus is on early childhood, which is a period of childhood that you have extensive knowledge about, Kay. So Article 12 of the UNCRC states that the children who are capable of forming views have the right to freely express them and have them given due weight in decisions affecting them. When we talk about Article 12, we often simplify this to speaking about the voice of the child. Kay, for you, what do concepts like views and voice mean when we're talking about young children in particular, those under five? What a good question. And just to say, I always feel I'm learning. So it'll be great in terms of these conversations and where we go. I mean, maybe to tap into, and the first thing that I sort of respond to is, is our use of voice. Um, and this is coming from um, point of view as I have used voice in the past. In fact, there was a whole research project I had with others in the 90s that was literally titled the Voice of the Child. So um, I'm coming from that with all humility, but I'm increasingly concerned about us using voice to encapsulate kind of where we want to get to. Um, I know it's a powerful term in civic society and we use it, but and I've got a couple of reasons that I want to share, and I always welcome other people's views on it. But just at, at a very basic level, I think however much you put it into quotes, it does risk privileging certain types of communication. And I remember reading this really powerful article, um, I believe by a Finnish researcher, working with disabled children. And she responded quite strongly to that, and the children responded quite strongly so that being um, a disabled point of view, so like why would we use a term um, that might risk that? I mean, getting a little bit more conceptual with it, um, also kind of concerned, particularly when we use it in the singular, because why would we expect all children to have the same voice? Um, so obviously we could plural, I still have a few further problems with it. And I think this is maybe inspired two ways. One is often in very well-meaning ways when we're working with children and we present the voice of the child, usually somebody has selected what that is and it's often not the children who selected. So I think it, it doesn't really acknowledge that that's underneath there. I mean, that's fine, but I think that mix of not being clear that this is a selected quotation from a child, powerful, um, but that it's not sort of co-produced uh, perhaps always in the way that it's presented. And the last bit that worries me about it is really from our experience in terms of family law. And I think it's because, I guess that really brought out to me, 
is, you know, it, it, there's a convenience for adults if you think you have the voice of the child, that it's the authentic, and often that's how it's phrased, the authentic voice of the child. And as you may know, when there's contested cases in family law in Scotland, um, there is a requirement for courts to consider children's views. And often what they do is they ask um, what is now called the child welfare reporter to go um, and access the child's views and present them in the report. And you can see how actually that's quite convenient for the court because then they have the view of the joy, the voice of the child, um, and they can um, hopefully enter that into decision making. But when we're doing research with children and looking at that, it has real problems. So it's really notable that um, courts tend to take more consideration of a child's views expressed in that way if it's perceived as rational, unchanging, um, and, and autonomous, like it has, like has to be independent. But that raises all kinds of issues that we're talking about with the courts because of what children tell us, right? Like, why would your view always be sort of set, you know, months in advance of the court eating? Why wouldn't it be emotional and relational? So I think the challenge for us, I suggest, mm -hmm. is to be able to incorporate all that kind of complexity um, and that applies to younger children as well as older children. And actually, it is often younger children who are involved um, in family law cases. So for that, I mean, I feel there's a challenge for us um, in terms of that use of the voice of the child. I mean, as we know, actually, Article 12 doesn't use the voice of the child. It's not using it. Um, and even with that, I think it's, it's useful for us to remember that there's a range of participation rights um, in the UNCRC that we need to consider that views is only one and it's quite tied in Article 12 in terms of decision-making. So I think that's very valuable, but I also think this is an opportunity for us to think of participation widely. You know, it's also about involvement, about engagement, activism, feelings. And I think that's something that all of those like yourself, Kamel, who really are experienced about working with young children can really bring to the table. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think it's really interesting, actually, when I looked over this question myself and started to think about it. I also um, understand your point of view that it's a very popular and quite a powerful phrase. But yes, I agree that um, the danger is that it oversimplifies how children express themselves, um, as well as oversimplifying the article, as you say, the, you know, the substantive right in itself. As you say, voice doesn't appear in Article 12 and then simplifying to the article um, as just voice. I think that, yeah, I think the danger is that we miss um, the broader meaning of how children communicate in different ways with different views. And also the adult's responsibility in, in supporting that, that to happen, I guess, by just simply saying children's voices um, Definitely the danger of simplifying means we miss some complex um, thinking around that, um, particularly as, as you've mentioned, you know, children's voices actually for pre-verbal or non-verbal children, what does that mean and what does that look like? Um, and I think, although powerful and popular, the phrase can then also cause some, for some people, confusion, um, that okay, if children aren't verbal, what does voice mean for those children? And for us as adults who are trying to listen to those voices. So I'm, I, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm in that process of learning and really unpicking that myself because it, it seems powerful, but yeah, there's so many questions around using voice, I think. What you're saying really chimes with me about, um... About this concern, like I once started to draft with others um, a, a paper about thinking about age discrimination, like which we know in um, in the law in uh, qualities law doesn't really apply in the same way to younger children, which I think is a gap. But like if you sort of apply that to it, it, it is I suggest kind of amazing how casually we exclude younger children, and then as you said, even more so, you know, the very youngest of children, and it's just like, oh well, you know they couldn't communicate by our methods. And it's kind of like, well, we wouldn't accept that for other things. And this is a challenge for me too, but I mean, guess that's the whole point as we move forward. How can we really challenge ourselves? And the classic thing, of course, learning from the young children themselves and people such as yourself, Carmel, with experience, 
you know, but how can we take this forward and, and respect everybody's human dignity? Yeah, for sure. And I think learning from the children, especially when we're trying to understand them, is the perfect, perfect way to do that. Um, I've learned a lot about how to get an insight into children's views by spending time and working with them. And I still wouldn't say I'm an expert. I'm still learning because all children are different and have different ways of expressing their views. So it's certainly a challenge. I wonder if that links on to the next question that we, we're going to consider. Um, and that's around the um, capacities of children. Um, so the Children's Scotland Act in 2020 was seen to take a significant step in replacing a presumption that children are capable of forming views from the age of 12, with a presumption that um, children younger than 12 were not capable perhaps of, of forming or expressing their views. What do you think are the most challenging barriers we face as adults in considering children's capacity um, and what perhaps are our assumptions that we need to break down? Yes, another good question that you posed. I, I mean, the first thing I would say is just to pause because I was very interested in those elements as were others um, uh, in terms of improving uh, the, the family law in that regard. And I'm just so pleased that there has been improvements, you know, thanks to a whole lot of people, including um, young people from Yellow and others and organizations. And it is just great that we move forward. Um, and, and now I, I hope that we have better legislation that really sort of challenges that presumption. Mm -hmm. uh, it draws upon um, uh, ideas of certainly Article 12, and in particular, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child did a general comment on Article 12, which, as we know, is an authoritative interpretation of it. And uh, it's a general comment I quite like. Um, and I think within that, and these arguments were quite useful, it seemed in terms of persuading the Scottish Government and the Parliament um, to make sort of further amendments, but it's got, I think, really great elements like a child should be presumed to have the capacity to form his or her own view. And there's no age limit to that. And a child need not have comprehensive knowledge to be considered capable. And your point earlier, Carmel, is really underlined there, is uh, you know, that children should be supported through information and other means um, and indeed you know, trusted relationships in terms of developing their views under Article 12. And I think all those things are, are incredibly powerful and well said. And I think certainly as we go forward in Scotland in addressing this issue, the celebration, might I say, of Article 12 is so much that sometimes it's forgotten that, uh, of course, all the rights um, under the UNCRC and wider apply, but also particularly there are other participation rights articulated in the UNCRC, like the right to accessing and give information, which are absolutely key um, to, to on the topic. I mean, to go a little bit further, um, I think it's well worth us as adults continuing to sort of interrogate what we mean by capacity. Um, I think we, you know, it's one of those words that um, we might use quite casually and fair enough, but it actually starts to become quite weighty um, in terms of the implications that it means. So, for example, I think we use capacity, but like, are we thinking, starting to confuse it with legal capacity, which has different kinds of elements. And I, I would suggest that um, particularly with that act going uh, forward is that it's well, well time to interrogate that, I guess. Um, so, I mean, different elements of that is, do we always consider that there's different kinds of decisions being made and maybe we might view if we did want to rely on capacity or children being capable differently. So I think often with family law, um, there has been a risk that it's treated as if you consider children's views, it's about them making the decision. And actually it's very clearly in law, agree or disagree, that it's not about the children making a decision, it's about their views being given um, due weight in decision-making. So I would say there is actually, why are we so concerned about our children being capable? Do you know? I mean, they have views. We need to give them weight, but I'm just really not sure why we would get caught up in ideas of capacity. I think another one is if we are going to put a lot of um, effort, uh, reliance on it, maybe use that word, then we should 
be pretty clear what we mean by it and be pretty grounded on, on like how we're judging it or evidencing or thinking about it. And what I would draw upon is some work I did with Joe Moran Ellis, where we were looking how it was used, particularly in childhood studies research and related concept competence. Yeah, and I, actually they're often just mixed up between them. Mm-hmm. But particularly, I think some things cross over. So one is how it is often it is often used casually without any um, sort of real definition behind it. It's often used as a threshold concept. So you either are capable or you're not rather than arguably you could see it as a continuum. Bringing in that point again, how much is it contextual? I would suggest it should be considered that way. So, you know, it it is about how one's supported and facilitated, et cetera, rather than you are or you're not. Um, And then a, a really important issue for us is what happens if children want to do participate in ways that aren't uh, comfortable or um, what we want in terms of adult terms. What happens if children are expressing by being emotional or angry or not wanting to participate? Um, And that I think we need to figure out um, how we consider the the contributions from that. And my last comment before I look forward to your um, (laughs) questions in return is that I felt really challenged and found it interesting to find that in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, they have provisions that just assume people have legal capacity. It's a very different starting point than than we have. Interestingly, you then get to the general common and the one group they exclude are children with disabilities, which I would disagree with. Um, But nonetheless, I think that kind of turning around, I think is really good for us. You know, what happens if we just actually went from children being capable? Where would we go in terms of that? So what do you think, Carmel? (laughs) I think you have really interesting and and thought provoking um, points. So I'm trying to, to work through everything you've said. Um, I agree. I, I looked into the evolving capacities and tried to to work out exactly what is meant. Um, and I do think, as you say, and I'm not an expert in in the legal elements of rights. That's something I'm trying to understand myself. Um, but I do feel like it's slightly different in a legal context to maybe an education or an early childhood context. Um, I feel like. In the early childhood settings that um, this is actually quite um, the idea is actually something that I think could inspire other people and, and people beyond the sector, because I think generally early childhood professionals and people that work with very young children have an image of a child and that recognizes a child's capabilities um, in all sorts of ways, in a, in a holistic way. Um, and viewing children as capable, I think, is quite evident in different early years guidance. So in curriculum guidance um, in Scotland and in, in the UK. Um, so I think for early childhood practitioners, we've got we come from a positive space when we're thinking about children's capacities or capabilities, um, which I do think is perhaps slightly different in other sectors or um, with other age groups. Um, perhaps because we've observed and we recognise that children are very capable from a very, very young age to, to contribute their ideas, whether that is through showing how they feel. So emotions are really powerful, aren't they, with, with young children? But actually, I feel that's a, a way that they communicate with us, their views and ideas. So, so I do think the early childhood sector is possibly really well positioned to advocate to other adults as a positive space. Um, for providing children with opportunities to participate in decision making by share, you know, giving them space to share their views. Um, and again, I think there's pedagogies that really support that, that resonate both with the UNCRC, that encourage listening to children and recognising children as rights holders and, and with um, capabilities. Um, for example, the Regio approach or the Freudian principles. So I do think that actually going forward, one of the questions we were asking was what tools, resources, what challenges um, are needed to to progress, I suppose, for around incorporation. And I do think that the early years professionals are a really valuable resource that could really champion um, for children's 
current existing evolving capacities. Um, but I agree with you also that that really needs to be looked at more closely and, and probably understood um, in different context um, in a much, you know, much clearer way. Well, I think that's so well said, and I go down similar kinds of thoughts. So I just had the benefit of being at the recent International Frobel Conference and learning from others. And I mean, it's just so clear that there are um, amazing um, pedagogies and early learning practitioners, as you said, who absolutely tap into this and have skills. So often what I think is um, almost kind of turning things around is that the early childhood sector has so much to share, you know, um, in terms of considering about, well, all people, but certainly older children and young people. So whenever anybody comes to me, it's like, you know, this is a really complex policy question. I don't know how we're gonna ask this of young children or whatever. I'm just like, well, the beginning is like, let's go to some of the early years practitioners because I always yeah. find like in these wonderful ways, they figure out how to make quite complex issues really meaningful and really engaging. So. You know, there's that classic in our field. It's not that children can't communicate or aren't capable of communicating. It's us mm -hmm. as adults, if we're the facilitators in that case, is about us figuring out how to do communication. It's on us. Um, yes. And yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's a really good place to maybe summarize this, this conversation. So um, as you say, I think it is, it's adults' responsibilities need to access and try and understand the views of children, whatever age they may be. Um, and I think, reflecting what, you, what you've just said, is that we see very creative and determined practice in early childhood. So one of the reasons we've, we're having these conversations is because early years practitioners or people working within early childhood have asked more questions. There seems to be an increased um, interest in understanding what incorporation means. And there's some fear and concerns that maybe this is going to be a challenge. And I think what's really positive from this conversation is, I think we recognize the early childhood sector is really adaptable. And I think they're ready for this challenge and already armed with tools really to, to progress the, you know, the changes that are going to be needed following incorporation. It's okay. You can well, I just to add to it, and just as we were speaking, I think also that um, it's a resource and an opportunity for, for all that experience and knowledge and discussion to be shared more widely. And I think that that kind of dialogue which this is introducing is just really important. It's not, early, it's not just early childhood, do you know what I mean? It's a challenge to, to all of us about how we go forward. Yeah, completely. Well, thank you, Kay, for joining us and starting. Um, this conversation series with us. Um, it's been really good to talk to you and, and very inspiring, I'm sure, for everybody, but particularly me listening and, and joining in the conversation with you. Um, following this conversation, we'd love to receive any comments or questions at Children's Parliament, as we do plan to carry the discussion forward through our early years project and sector webinars later in the year. So thank you for joining us and thank you very much, Kay, for giving us your time. <laughs>